Right, um, I'd like to show you a polyhedron. Not just any polyhedron though, this is an eniahedron. It's a polyhedron with nine sides. Enia, enia, I don't know, any is the Greek word for nine as far as I know. This is also called the Herschel polyhedron. We're in the Herschel building, which is where Newcastle's School of Math, Stats and Physics is based. And that's how it came into my life. Someone said, I found this Herschel graph. Can we do anything with it? Is there any particular Herschel here or? I think R1 is named after Alexander Herschel. He's like third gen Herscheling. We think that's the Herschel that we're named after. And we think that this graph was named after him. I don't think he actually found this graph but someone named it for him because he'd thought about these kinds of things. I was shown a graph, not a polyhedron. Me and a colleague, Michael White, who's now retired, we of course went straight to Wikipedia. There was a short page about it at the time and it said the Herschel graph is the smallest non-Hamiltonian polyhedral graph. I'll draw the graph first and then I'll be able to show you what each of those things means. It's got 11 points, which is another unusual number. Nine is a weird number of sides for a polyhedron to have, I think. It's not a multiple or a factor of any of the, uh, the regular ones. It's not clear how you get a nine-sided shape. Join all these bits up and there we go. Okay, so this is the graph of a polyhedron. We didn't know what the polyhedron was at the time, but the, the first thing was it's non-Hamiltonian. Uh, there's another good bit of history there. A Hamiltonian graph is one where you can start at one point, visit every other point going along the edges, exactly visit each point once, and come back to where you started. Can you give me a simple example? I'll give you a really simple example. I'll give you a triangle. Right, so triangle, three points joined with lines, and I can go start here, up to there, down to there, and back again, back where I started. Each point once and only once. Each point once, yeah. If I had like a square, there's a Hamiltonian cycle on that. I can add some more diagonals. I don't have to use all the edges. I just have to use all the points once. That's Hamiltonian. The other thing with graphs is they could be Eulerian, which is using every edge once. That's for another video. That's, that's another time. A triangle's Hamiltonian, a square's Hamiltonian. This thing's non-Hamiltonian. So that means I can't do each dot once and only once and get back to the start? Yeah, we could try all day. We could say, we'll start at a point, we'll try and visit them all. We will inevitably get in trouble. So we'll start here. I'll go up there. I'll think, oh, I'll come back on myself. I'll be clever and I'll try and be systematic here. So I'm going to go up there and right at this point I've got, I can go either to that one and I'm stuck because I've been to those two already. I can go to that one and I've already been to those two. I could sit and try every option and say it can't be done. And I have to be really sure that I really had tried every option. The proof that it's non-Hamiltonian is really quite simple. This graph is bipartite. A bipartite graph is one where you can separate the points into two separate sets and the edges only ever go between the sets. So they're normally drawn something like this. You draw two rows of them and the edges only ever go across this, like, this middle line between them. If I added an edge here, this would either not be bipartite anymore or I'd have to move something. So I can't have an edge between things on the same row. An equivalent condition to being bipartite is if you can colour in the vertices in two colours so that adjacent vertices are different colours. Fun fact, I'm completely colourblind, so I'm not going to use colours. I'm going to draw circles around some of these. So I'll draw a circle around that one. It's next to these two, and that one has to have a circle and there. And like that. Okay, so here every edge is between a circled point and a non-circled point. And that would also make it Yeah, so I could, I, could, I could draw it out again in the, the two rows thing, but it's bipartite. Okay, and that also means it's non-Hamiltonian. That, and one more fact, there's an odd number of points. Because if I've got a bipartite graph, each time I move along an edge, I swap sides. If I move an odd number of times, I must end up on the other side for the one I started, which means it can't be a cycle. I'm not where I started. I know I'm on the other side. I don't care where. So it's non-Hamiltonian. Um, it's small. That was the first word I said. The other thing is it's polyhedral, which means this is the graph of a polyhedron, or there are polyhedrons whose graph is this. Um, and the way in which it's the graph of polyhedron is it's got all of the points are vertices of a polyhedron and the edges are edges of a polyhedron. The faces, well, we can sort of see in this diagram, I've got some quadrilateral type things. When you draw a graph, it doesn't really matter where the points are though. So those aren't the real faces of a polyhedron. Given I haven't shown you the polyhedron yet, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw the graph of a cube. You know what a cube is? Yeah. 
I do. <laughs> so, I mean, the classic way of drawing a cube that I think everybody starts doing in school is you draw two squares and join the corners together. So that looks like I'm looking down on a cube. Or looking up at a cube. It's like I've flattened the cube. I can see a face here, I can see some of the other sides. There's a final, there's a sixth face that's gone somewhere. Inevitably, to flatten this onto paper, that, that face has had to disappear. You can either say it's the outside of the paper, or you can say that it's just underneath everything else and you can't see it. So that's a graph of a cube. That's the graph of a cube. This is the graph of some... The Herschel Enyahedron, which, I mean, must exist. Uh, but we didn't know what it was. No one had described it as far as we knew. How do we even know that makes a polyhedron then if it's not obvious to you what it is? I mean, you look at it, you say, <laughs> you can see there's some faces here. I think importantly, this thing's planar. None of the edges cross each other. It meets the criteria. <laughs> yeah, every, everything's sort of closed. I don't have like a, a random extra edge coming off that's not forming either at least a triangle. For the cube, I can sort of see from my drawing here how to make it 3D. I can say, I'm going to pick up this face and lift it up. And that'll be the top one. These ones will become the ones on the side and my extra face will go on the bottom. So that's what I tried to do with this drawing. I thought I'll pick the middle of it and I'll pick it up. Uh, these ones on the outside will stay on the paper and the rest will sort of come up with it. How did you do that? With a computer or physically or? <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, I'm really clumsy. I got some bits of paper and I thought, well, I'll cut out the base and I'll cut out what I think the side should look like and I'll just sort of stick it together roughly. Um, I don't want to go for some symmetries yet. So I, I spent an hour or so making this model and went to Michael and said, is this the polyhedron? It definitely has the same graph. Is that good enough? It really did not look nice. Uh, he looked at it and immediately said no. He said, no, that can't be it. It's a polyhedron, but it's not the one we want. Was it just not pretty enough? It wasn't pretty enough and Michael had looked further down the Wikipedia page than me. And he had spotted that this graph has D6 symmetry. D6 symmetry is the same as the symmetries of the hexagon, which is weird. And I, I had to go and look at the Wikipedia page myself uh, because looking at this graph, it doesn't look like a hexagon at all. I've got lots of four-sided shapes. I've got some things with four edges coming out. I've got two reflection lines of symmetry there, but I haven't got a rotation of order three or six, which is what I'd want. So. It wasn't at all obvious to us how that could be. So you, so you knew it had to have these symmetries as a new requirement? Then. Yeah, so we know the graph has those symmetries. That The definition of a symmetry on a graph is if you can make up a permutation of all the vertices so that if two points were linked in the first version, and you only permute them, they have to be linked in the, the new version. The symmetry group of that is D6, the symmetries of the hexagon. So, so that's, that's been proved without reference to the actual polyhedron. No one has looked at it and said, yeah, there's... I can see the symmetries. They've, they've worked it out through writing things down. So we wanted to make a polyhedron that had those symmetries. So the question is, where's our rotation? Where's our threefold rotation? You can look at the points on the graph. I can rule some out immediately. These ones with four things coming out, there's absolutely no way I'm going to divide that up into three rotations and that'll be it. The remaining points all have degree three, three things coming out of them. So they could work. So that's this kind, that kind, and that kind. Yep. Turns out it's this one. That's where the symmetry is. I can rotate the things around it and then everything else, it's clear how you do that. There's our reflection symmetry, really. At least that's obvious in the diagram. So here's a rotation here, there's a rotation around there. So we think there's the top, there's the bottom of our shape. There's the middle where there's a reflection symmetry. So all we have to do is, if that's, we'll say, at z equals zero at the middle height, then the points connected to it have to be a bit higher and then this top point has to be at some other height. The final thing to work out is where do these need to be so that these faces are actually flat? They're quadrilaterals, so they're not necessarily flat. If the points are in different places, there could be a crease, a fold in it. We had a fun afternoon of writing down some algebra. We wrote down vector coordinates for um, each of the points in terms of these heights that were unknown and applying the things that we knew about them. So we knew that the middle points all had to be around an equilateral triangle for that symmetry. The next level up, those had to also be arranged uh, with the rotational symmetry and line up on top of the middle edges. That left us with two unknowns, two heights. Turns out the height of the top point has to be four thirds of the middle points.
Yeah. So you so you solve all that, and you, you end up with one degree of freedom still. You can pick how tall, how squashed or stretched this shape can be. There's no more conditions we can apply. There's nothing else that we want um, that would tell us to pick a particular one. Okay. When we've made it, we've ended up going with, well, we want the, there are these middle rhombuses on the shape. Um, we said, well, let's make them squares because you might as well arbitrarily. Squares, squares are nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so there we go. There's our shape. Here it is. I got a model of it. It's got this sort of belt of rhombuses, those squares we've chosen around the middle, and then the other faces end up being kites, um, which is quite interesting. And hopefully you can see some of the symmetries we were looking for. So, so these two these two points here, your special three points. My, my special points are the, the top and the bottom where my fingers are touching it now, and it, it can rotate around that. The best way of seeing actually the rotation symmetry is if I turn it head on here, the cross section, the plan view is an equilateral triangle. So there it is. So there's my three rotation symmetry. So the, the one I made had the same symmetries as the drawing, which is just two kinds of reflection. This still has the two reflections. I've got one here and one sort of through there. Um, but I also have that threefold rotation, which gets me the full D6 symmetry group. Could the graph have been drawn that way? Could the graph be drawn to show all those symmetries? Or be, can that not happen because of 3D-ness? I, I mean, I'll, I'll say 3D-ness as well. <laughs> I haven't proved it. I don't think it could. Um, because of that problem of you've got to flatten it down, um, I think in order to have that rotation, I would have to end up with some points in the drawing on top of each other. And what's, uh, the, what's the name of that object again? This is the Herschel Enneahedron. Have you got a brain for puzzles? Maybe you just want to improve your solving skills. Either way, there's no better place to flex your neurons than here on Brilliant. They're overflowing with courses and quizzes, everything you could want to learn about math, science, computer programming. There's new stuff being added all the time. As you can see, it's elegant, it's fun, highly interactive. You're really going to engage with this. But it's not just enjoyable, it's aiming to change the way you think. And who knows where that can lead? Perhaps the start of a whole new career. It's never too late. To try Brilliant for free, visit brilliant.org slash number file or scan the QR code on screen. There's also a link in the description. Using that can also get you 20% off an annual premium subscription. Our thanks to Brilliant for supporting number file. The mathematician said, no, in fact, you can cut it down even more because if I have three tetrahedron, there's only one way I can put three tetrahedron together. So here are my little paper tetrahedron I made earlier for you. Here's our two put together. Go on a straight line and you never turn, you never pass through another corner. You might say, what happens when you hit an edge? But it makes perfect sense to go straight over an edge. You can just driving your car over a ridge or walking over a ridge. 